Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. Happy Monday. Hope you had a fabulous, safe, and sane 4th of July. I don't know where it is in your parts of the country, but uh, this is one of those things I've never seen before because all the counties around me were saying, hey, we're shutting down for no, no city authorized firework displays, whatever. It's like all the citizens just said, oh, really? We're going to do our own fireworks show. And it was like a war zone here all night long. It was pretty incredible. Hopefully nobody got hurt. I'm sure somebody did, but uh, it was a great 4th of July. I hope you guys are all safe and sane. Not like our markets are today. All right, um, you know, I'm doing the show a little bit different. Normally, I walk through our top seven markets out there, and then I will go into the topic du jour, open questions, or bring on the guest. I've switched that around. I will do a, a short piece. Well, not short. I'll do a lengthy piece today about the electrical vehicle boom, which is a very interesting one to me. And at the end, I'll do some Q&A, and then I'll go into what happened in the market today, as well as what to look for for tomorrow. That will be what we're going to plan for today. So over the weekend, you guys may have seen my, my chart of the week. I do a chart of the week piece where I go into different, I don't know, a chart that I find interesting. Oh, oh uh, I had it up there. I was going to do something flashy. I try to be cool. I did a chart of the week on Tesla and its unbelievable market cap rise. For those of you who haven't seen that one, check it out. It's rather interesting that all of a sudden Tesla jumped over $200 billion market cap, eclipsing ExxonMobil, which of course is a long-standing staple of Americana and financial markets, but also blowing away Toyota. And if you break everything back down to if they were all right around the same number of shares outstanding, I did a nice comparison there. Thought you might like that one. Now, it was um, a lot of questions spurred by that, which led me to today's topic, which is the electric vehicle boom. I think it goes without saying that we are in an unbelievable market rally for a company like Tesla, which hands down is the leader in the industry. But every time you have a leader and is starting to break away in a market, all of a sudden competition comes flying in. And nowhere would that be more evident than looking at the the novices, the neophytes, the individuals of Robin Hood who are out there buying basically whatever they can in that space. And I thought, you know what, what a nice, what a, what a great place to start here. So what I did is I went through in the last 24 hours alone, because if you hadn't noticed, Tesla had a huge 15% jump again, coming on the heels of another 15% on uh, Thursday session. So just massive move up in Tesla. But here's what those old Robin Hood traders were looking at. I will uh, scroll up here so you guys can see it. Neo is the number one change in the accounts at Robinhood. In the last 24 hours, there was over 33,000 new positions opened in NEO. Not 32,000 shares, 33,000 different positions opened. That is a 33,740. Pretty incredible. Now, um, yeah, Jeffrey McCollister says, everyone been sleeping on my NEO. <laughs> Not today, it may have woken up. But look at, you also have NEO, Tesla, Solo. In the last 24 hours, these are all three electric vehicle companies, and they are hands down the leaders there. So your Robinhood traders pouring money in but you can make the argument that uber is getting into that space you also have plug which is in that battery space i believe ayro is also in that space amazon as well in purchasing uh one of the companies that i'm really excited on which is rivian you also have fuv is also in that space and believe it or not microsoft in that space as well so thought it was kind of interesting just to take a peek there to start at where the money is flowing. And maybe what we'll do is I will show you the Tesla chart just to get started here, and then we can work backwards from there. Uh, and by the way, I didn't give a shout out to everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, I see all the names pouring up. It's like my, my own little condensed family over here. I love it. Uh, Patrick says, I want a Tesla Model S. Should I wait to buy one? That's up to you. If you love the Tesla and you want it, I know there are some, uh, judging by the comments I've received on the chart of the week, there's people who are diehard fanatics for Tesla. And if you love it, then buy it. If that's what makes you happy and that's what you want to spend your money on, go for it. I think you'll have to wait a couple of years before you really have serious, serious competition for Tesla, which is probably why they're leveraging themselves so much and pushing and getting dominant market share now because these other companies are popping up. And I'll, and I'll read off some names here and we'll look at some charts um, so you guys can see it. But let's start off with what's happening out there with Tesla. Tesla's move today, just ridiculous. I actually thought we were gonna see what's called an island reversal. Now an island reversal would be something like this. Uh, you guys can see that screen up there. Let me uh, take off the order bar. Um, and I'm gonna just take off today's, just pretend today didn't happen. And so we look at that last candle there, right? One more click, there we go. 
An island reversal would be on the hard right edge of your chart here where you see that candle right above 1200 on Tesla. And then the next day it gaps down and has a, a nice retracement. I was actually expecting that because you had rather high volume, uh, it just a, a big gap, especially for a company like Tesla who's really not making any money right now. Maybe down the road they will. And then all of a sudden today, that story changed. It was just even further up. You're up 15 and a quarter percent on Tesla today. And of course, uh, that brought up most of the other publicly traded companies in that space. Some of those being uh, FUV, as you saw, being a Robin Hood favorite. Here's FUV, which had a nice big up day on huge volume, gave back some of those gains. You also had, um, uh, what was the other? Solo would be another one, S-O-L-O. -O. This is a company called Electromechanica. Uh, also having a great day. Now, we, we talked about Nikola, which is another company in that space, um, and I made a challenge. I think it's, I said I think it's gonna get underneath 30, if I was not mistaken. Uh, we're seeing a huge nosedive right now, so we'll see how, how quickly it gets there, but uh, still, I still am on par for winning that one. So, most of the companies in this space doing rather well, and it's that case of the rising tide floats all boats. I wanna draw a parallel here to another industry that I was knee deep in when it started and when it happened, and that was back in 1998 when the internet was booming. What you had happen was all of a sudden everybody started popping up, coming out of the woodwork saying, hey, we are now a dot-com company. There are a lot of companies and businesses that are shifting their focus now saying, hey, we wanna get in the electric vehicle space. I'll give you an example, Dyson, the maker of vacuum cleaners was actually going to get into the electrical vehicles, electric vehicle space. Of course, I don't know how that would work down the road because eventually people would say, they're Dyson, they suck. Oh, the vacuum jokes would just go on and on. But they, they realized it wasn't gonna be feasible for them to go into that market. I just thought it was interesting to see how all of a sudden they th there's a viable market. Let's see if we can take our technology and make a vehicle out of it. So there are a lot more and, and a lot of people focusing on a company called NEO. I didn't bring up that chart for you. NEO, one of the darlings today. I mean, this thing just ripped today. Uh, very akin to what happened with Tesla, but notice the climactic volume. When I see huge moves on climactic volume like this, that means a retracement is coming. I'm not gonna short this stock just because I don't have the chutzpah to do it. Uh, I, I just don't have the confidence. This thing is, is right now riding this tidal wave of euphoria for electric vehicles. So um, those are some of the key players. I'll read off a whole bunch more that are in this space, but the, one of the questions that spurred this for me was, let me see, um, was this one, and we talked about this. How do you get into the space? Do I buy um, uh, Electromechanica? Do I buy uh, Candy Technologies? Do I buy Neo? Do I uh, Acromoto? Do I buy Nikola? Do I buy, Te what do I buy? I wanna get in the space. And my comment was, you should look at ETFs and see if there's an ETF out there. And of course, one of you actually went and did that. Uh, Heath says, I was looking at KARS as an ETF to get into electrical vehicle space. What are your thoughts? And I thought, you know what, that's, that's an interesting topic. I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna run with it a little bit more. So, a couple different things. When you hear that a, an ETF represents a specific market segment that you would have interest being in, you had better go and break apart that ETF and see what it's made of. Because I'll tell you right now, if I was buying an ETF or building a portfolio of EV stocks, of companies that were in that space, obviously I have to have some Tesla in there. Clearly, I'd be adding NEO to that portfolio. I'd probably be adding Solo and FUV. I would also be adding two companies, which is gonna be very interesting, Amazon and Ford, because they are major holders in one of my favorites, which is Rivian, which is an American-based one out of Illinois. I'm, I'm fab fascinated by the Rivian story. I think it's great. I almost pre-ordered the vehicle, but I'm gonna hold off a little bit. So you gotta find out those companies. If you look at most of the ETFs like KARS here that Heath is asking about, they don't have exposure to a lot of the companies I just mentioned. Yes, they have Tesla, but they also have some other companies that you may not want to have exposure to. So let me show you what I would recommend you all do when you're thinking about this. So I'll go over here to my screen, have some stuff ready. Uh, by the way, here are some of the other companies. Rivian, the one that I mentioned, I'm an outdoorsy guy. Look at that truck. I mean, come on, man. That's got every, it has a pull out stove and full kitchen that just slides out of the, of the bed. I mean, this is, Hallelujah. Uh, I think the front of it looks really stupid, but I love the idea of a truck. I'm a truck guy. That's a good one. Here's Neo. Okay, you got the Neo, which is you know, obviously the Chinese company. You've got Nikola, which is just at this point um, ideas. There's nothing produced. 
Rivian's gonna have their first production vehicle out at the end of 2020. Neo's already producing vehicles, uh, Acromoto is as well. So, you know, it, it's a question of where are these companies in relationship to their development pipeline. There's other companies out there like Jack or Greeley or ZD or Zotai or Bayek out of China. I mean, these are companies that are big players that we don't know yet. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of companies who are already producing vehicles. So the parallel I was drawing back to the dot-com bubble was all these pop companies popped up. Same thing here. What you end up having is a lot of them will disappear. There will most likely be a consolidation as a, a company who's thriving and has big capital backing like Rivian, like um, Tesla, like um, Nikola. Those companies have huge financial backing, so they can go out and they can cherry pick and take away the key people from these smaller companies or even buy patents and technology, which will probably happen and a lot of the smaller ones will disappear. So in part of that building that portfolio, you build the ones that have the best prospects for success. Obviously, Tesla is your portfolio. Neo, I would say as well. Nikola, to me, is a very skeptical one, but if they do get into that big truck market, which I think would be their focus, that would um, kind of carve their niche in that marketplace. So um, let me run through what I would look for with regards to these ETFs in building out that portfolio if I was looking at an EV portfolio. All right, um, first off, I would go to, I'm gonna bring up four of them here, all right? There's DRIV, so there's four ETFs out there. This is the Global X Autonomous and Electric Vehicles ETF, DRIV is the ticker symbol. Now before I dive into these, I'm making this statement. I don't think that you should buy any of these. Do not go out and buy any of these four ETFs. I'll show you why in just a second, or maybe you guys can tell me why in just a second. Let's get some interactive going here. Okay, so you've got uh, DRIV, which is that Global X Autonomous Electric Vehicles. If you click on the holdings here, I just want you to scroll down and look at what they actually hold. Notice the number one holding here is Nvidia. Number two is Microsoft. The third on this list is Tesla. How many are actual car companies? Tesla, Toyota. So you wanted to buy an electric vehicle company, but if you bought DRIV, you're just buying really two companies, Tesla and Toyota. The rest you're buying technology companies, right? You look at this list, you got Intel, Apple, Alphabet, Cisco, Qualcomm, Samsung, Nvidia, Microsoft. I mean, why don't you just buy the FANG stocks? Christ, you got it all in one share right there. So to me, this would not be a good representation of an EV company. Of the industry, yeah, those are some of the leaders, obviously, in the technology and the, um, uh, the um, AI. Obviously, those companies are the main players in that space. So let's go look at another one. That was DRIV. I'm looking at it now as IDRV. It's a different one. It's the iShares Self-Driving EV and Technology ETF. Now, at least this one says more of a technology ETF. I'll scroll down. And you notice number one holding in uh, Tesla. Great, I'm feeling good about that. But it actually only has three car companies in the top, whatever, top 10 holdings. Tesla, Toyota, and Siemens. Even Siemens is not really a car company. But all of this stuff is all really just the AI, artificial intelligence behind the technology. So I wouldn't go for that one either. Now let's go a little bit further. We'll go down to KARS, which is the one that uh, our viewer asked about. This is what, uh, what Heath asked for just a minute ago, which was cars as an ETF for that sector. So what do I think about KARS? If I look at cars here, it's the Crane Shares Electric Vehicle and Future Mobility Index. Interesting. So we scroll down, check out the holdings here. I've got Tesla. I'm just gonna read off the car manufacturers, the ones that are actually making vehicles. You have Tesla, Daimler, you have Volkswagen, Bayer Schemertenberg, which is BMW. So you have four in the space, and, and I would definitely say that this one is a better representation of the EV. If you wanna buy into electrical vehicles, not necessarily just the technology, then this one's much better because really three of these, or four of these companies are the leaders in the industry. BMW, Tesla, Volkswagen are, are clear leaders. I don't know about Daimler, um, you know, Chrysler, not really, I wouldn't say is in the lead area there. It's really Chevy, Nissan, Tesla, BMW are kind of the main leaders in the US. Um, but at least this one's a better representation. So I have one left here, which is eCar. E-K-A-R is the ticker symbol. It's the Ideonomic Shares Next Generation Vehicle and Technology ETF. You notice because it says technology ETF, it's probably gonna have a lot of the same holdings. So number one is Nvidia. I'll read the car companies again. You have Tesla, Daimler, Honda, Toyota. Okay, great. 
I, I think you'd be remiss if you didn't throw Honda in this space. They're such a huge global player. I mean, you know they're going to shift some of their focus to EV. So again, here you have four. The one that's missing on this list for this fund, which I would add if I was the fund manager, would certainly be BMW. BMW, I think, is going to be doing great things in that space. The Germans are very smart with their technology. So again, going back to Heath's question, I would be skeptical on a lot of this because it's not really the EV fund. It's, it's, a, it's a smattering of different technologies and companies within that space, but not specifically the car companies. So if I were to build one, I would probably buy some of Solo, I'd buy Acrimoto, I'd be Nikola, I'd buy Neo, I'd, I can't buy Rivian, right? Rivian's uh, backed by Amazon and Ford, which I really like that concept of Amazon and Ford. So I've got the IT technology provider in Amazon, and I have Ford, which could give me some production capabilities and also some learning about production line assembly. The interesting thing about Rivian, guys, was started by a 26-year-old kid. Crazy. Here I am doing a show in the home of my house making nothing, and this 26-year-old kid's running a billion-dollar company. All right, um, so that, that's kind of the view I have on those ETFs. I would probably wait and hold off unless one of those appeals to you. Now, here's the other reason why I need to be careful with that ETF. I'm going to bring up TradeStation here and real quickly just show you something. Here I have those four ETFs. Uh, it's probably going to be kind of hard for you guys to see that. I don't know if you guys can see that. So let me bump up the fonts here just a little bit. We'll bump them up to 24 just so you don't have to squint or anything. And I will make this guy a little bit bigger here just so you can see why I would be skeptical on any of these ETFs. Now I'm going to click them on the screen here. You guys can see they've been performing very well. Notice down at the bottom there's something I want you to pay attention to and that is volume. Okay, average for drive 21,000 shares traded a day. IDRV trading 11,000 shares a day. You have KARS trading 9,000 shares a day and ECAR trading 1,000 shares a day. This is why you gotta stay away from them. There's just not enough volume there for any sort of liquidity, right? If you buy this ECAR, you're thinking, great, I'm gonna have exposure to this industry. I'm gonna buy 500 shares. Well, you've moved almost 50% of the average daily volume with a 500 share purchase. Crazy, don't even bother doing it. That's the major one I want you to stick with or to pay attention to and stay away from in that space is the volume. Now they will get better. My guess is you'll see is someone that just specializes in the vehicles. Okay, next, uh, real quick, let me scroll down here and see if I can see any questions. Um, yeah, Patrick, you saw those the video. If you guys get a chance, look at Los Angeles fireworks show on 4th of July. Very, 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 very interesting how it was just absolutely nuts. I, I, yeah, anyway, I could go on and on about the fireworks. All right. Um, <laughs> Wait, what did I say, Big Eb, that, that made me not like by my, my topic? <laughs> okay. Um, why is Toyota's ticker symbol all numbers? Yeah, it could be just depending where it's listed. They do ADRs. There's all kinds of listings for Toyota. It should obviously be TM. All right. If you had to pick one, which would you rather buy, Nikola or Neo? This is a no-brainer. And I'm going to get some flack from you guys on this one. You guys let me know what you would rather buy, Nikola or Neo. The only negative thing that I have against Neo, which I just, I just bothers me, I don't like it, but there's nothing I can do about it, is it's based in China. That it is what it is, right? I just don't trust the numbers, the ratings, anything I get from China, I'm just obviously overly skeptical. Nikola has done nothing. They don't have a product. They don't have anything in production. They're, they're working on getting something possibly produced by the end of 2021. That's a long way away. That's a long way away to be spending $50 a share for a company and waiting for it to possibly have a run up. It also has a $17 billion market cap and it's not even remotely close to turning a profit. It won't turn a profit probably until, if it makes it, like 2025, 2026. So there's no way I'm gonna buy something today and say I hope it makes me money in six years. Not gonna happen. It's not, I'm, not, I'm not that big of a growth prospect guy to take that chance. Now, NEO, the, the making the money part is, you gotta take that with a grain of salt, I believe it's a $12 billion market cap, but they're actually producing vehicles. They're making stuff, and it's a more mainstream market. If you look at what the vehicle they're producing, it's, it's gonna be a cheap, cheap entry into the EV market, which I think a lot of people would be happy doing. So I would buy NEO uh, versus the Nikola, and, and for a couple other reasons. Let's take a peek at the price charts here just so I can drive home that. Um, let me make this full screen, and we'll look at 
NKLA, which has just been getting butchered recently. I told you why I thought this was going to be happening. I do think it's going to challenge that $30 mark here within the next month. Uh, that is because of forward expectations and the warrants on NKLA are, are basically pricing in about a $30 stock in five years. So this all got really inflated. That big spike is due to a lot of Robinhood traders, but it's also after a certain window of time because this is a reverse merger, it's backed into a stock. It was a company that was private, backed into an existing company. There's a 30-day window lockup where the insiders can't sell their shares, and that window is expiring, which means that all of a sudden these people could now start to sell their shares. And if you own this thing at 10 bucks and you turn around and it's worth 70, are you selling? I sure as hell would be, and I think that's what's happening right now, and you'll see it drop even more. So I think Nikola is still a victim of overhype. Um, I I love him. I mean, come on, let's let's look at some Nikola pictures here. You want to talk about sexy? Uh, where did I have? Oh, tell me I have Nikola. There's Nikola. This is some gorgeous looking stuff, man. That truck, that's pretty badass. Um, if they get into the energy company side of things, that's a big unknown. Power Sports, obviously big. Um, the distribution. This one, I think, is, is a big one for Nikola if they can get in that space and beat Tesla to it. Obviously, Tesla uh, was talking about that one for a while, but it's still yet to see something in production. So, yeah, it looks great. It does have some great big backing. You have venture capitalists pushing it. Neo, not as sexy, right? This isn't the most sexy looking vehicle on the planet, but you know what? It's cheap. It could make it mainstream much easier than uh, the Nikola, which is going to be a higher entry price point item. So um, the, the, that would, the two I had to choose from, just from a company um, stability perspective, I would probably go with Neo, even though I think Nikola has more backing and um, overall long run prospects. I would say if I was to say, give me a 10 year horizon on who would do better, if, and it's a big if, it's a bold capital letter if, Nikola can make it through that initial capital burn, then they might. I think to do ten years down the road, Nikola will bigger than will be bigger than Neo. But I think Neo has a better chance of making it because their price points easier, production lines already established. And um, my two cents. I'm sure a lot of people will be like, "Oh my gosh, you're crazy." <laughs> we need more Robinhood traders in the forex market. Um, Alexander says, "How do you check the volume?" Real simple. Um, I'll go like this. There's multiple ways. Number one, you can just add the volume study on your chart. And I don't know, Alexander, what platform you use, but I can show you on just about any platform. It's really, really simple. Um, I have volume down here at the bottom, but I also put it through this table here. So I have right now volume average. So I can see what it's doing average. I believe this average is set. Ooh, let me, um, let me see how many days this is. Let's see if I could format that average volume because you can go in here and change the volume and it's usually auto defined inputs it's 50 days so this is showing you on the, the last average traded volume oh, I'm sorry I don't even show you the chart the average volume for the last 50 days right now for DRIV ETF is 21,293 so to me those are so far below an, an average number that I'm even comfortable with you know my average number for me is 1,500,000 so these guys are a long way from getting onto that list. Um, on TD Ameritrade, you can it'll show you in the quote box. So when you pull up TD Ameritrade, I don't have my account up now, and I'm not going to log in right now. Um, when you pull up the quote for the chart, it'll tell you how many shares it's traded. Uh, you can also, I'll show you a real quick and easy free site. Um, I think I actually had it up here. Bear with me as I'm trying to do a million things at once again. All right, so this is Trading View, and you can go in here. We'll make it interactive chart. Um, it's a great free platform. I know a lot of people actually like this one. Of course, it's taking forever to load up, probably because I have a million things going on. But let's just look at uh, let's look at TSLA. TSLA. So here's Tesla, and down at the bottom of the chart, you can see the volume has been added to the vo to the bottom of the chart. So there's volume down there. In the indicators, you can probably go and add in average volume. So we'll go to V. Oops. Ah. Mm, yeah, so it's not going to give me an average volume. But uh, on a lot of them, you can just go back and deduce historically what it looks like. I mean, obviously, you want there to be a substantial amount of volume. Tesla obviously does have a good amount of volume. But yeah, you can pull them up on the platform. It usually tells you under the quote box when you bring up your stocks. Okay, so uh, where was I? I was talking about Neo versus Nikola. And to me, that's a no brainer. I just think the prospects long term, they're better for Nikola. I just don't know if they're going to make it through that hurdle. Right now, they're folk. This is the this is the problem with a startup, 
is the vehicle space, whether it's recreational vehicle, whether it's the energy or the automobile and trucking, which is their focus. I'm gonna call it four separate industries, right? Automobiles, trucking and distribution, shipping, you have power, which Nicola was looking at, and also recreational vehicles. Trying to spread your attention over four different asset categories at once is a very challenging thing to do. You really need to make sure that you focus on one, establish your footing and get traction there, get it generated. That's what uh, Tesla did really well. That's why I like the, the Rivian company. They're, all their cars are gonna be built on the exact same frame. So basically you can just tinker toy, plop on the new bodies, the new shells, the new tops. That is pretty cool to me and makes your production facility much more efficient. It's not gonna work the same for Nikola um, and Tesla even is gonna be different in that area. So there you go. Um, I did not, you know, I watched FedEx today, Rajesh, and unfortunately I was busy when this thing crossed below. For those of you guys don't know, I was looking at FedEx as a potential short. Let me go back to trade station here. Yeah, I saw that one today. I was like, dang it. I really wanted to get in on it. Uh, I rode, um, what, um, ah, let me see, let me bring in FDX, FDX. All right, there's your FedEx. Uh, you guys can see it just tiptoed across that line. I actually did it on um, for, uh, Thursday's session as well. Uh, which would have been a nice entry to that short, but recoup back up. No, I was not in that one today. And actually, because it did what it did today, this is no longer a valid trade for me, unfortunately. So we're moving that one and moving on. Um, Joseph says, Warren Buffett should invest in electric vehicles. The problem with uh, Mr. Buffett, and you know, it's hard to say anything bad about the guy, is he doesn't like new technologies. And that to me is, is a bad, bad sign. I mean, you, you not it's a bad sign. He does what works well for him. I think it'd be somewhat ignorant to think that all of a sudden electric vehicles are just disappearing and no one will use them anymore. There's a fascination with them. And of course, it's this push that, oh, if you use an electric vehicle, you are saving the planet. And I've read a lot of articles that said the contrary, that the, to get some of the materials needed for electric vehicles, you're actually doing more damage to the earth than you were by using a fossil fuel burning vehicle. Hey, look, I'm not, uh, I'm not a scientist, I'm not backing up. I do like the concept of not having to go to a gas station, pull my car into my driveway, charge it there, that sounds amazing. Um, and also the power that those things get. Um, I went for a ride in my friend's i8, uh, i3, i3 Sport. This is tiny little, it's funny because for the longest time I looked at the i3, you guys know what the i3 Sport looks like? It's so funny, I pulled, uh, he pulled up in this thing, I was like, oh, that's cute. Um, let's see if I can bring up a, a picture of it here just so you guys can see what the i3 Sport looked like. I3, um, I thought, what a goofy looking little vehicle, right? It didn't really appeal to me. And then we get in it and yeah, here it is. Yeah, you guys can see, there it is, the i3 Sport. This thing is a friggin' rocket. It, it's so unbelievably quick, I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is way faster than almost any car I've ever driven and it looks, it looks like a little putt-putt car that you'd take on a golf course, not actually race with. And obviously that's one of the lures of the electric vehicle space is the power and how you step on that thing and it just, boom, it's gone, takes off, instant torque. Pretty amazing. Um, GD says, Merlin, why do you care about Nikola Fundamentals? Don't we just trade stocks? How about after a great pullback to a great OTA style demand zone? That's a great point and I, and I agree with you. Yes, uh, I'm a little speculative on it. I just have a hard time. Um, I'm okay to take a small stab at something like this. Fundamentals do scare me sometimes when I'm thinking longer term investments. With Nikola, you know, if it does get down to that $30 mark, even if it actually closes the, the origin of this big gap, I think would probably be a pretty logical target, which would be somewhere right around, call it 35 bucks. You know, if it gets down to 35 bucks, which of course is according to the warrants, the price target for five years from now, um, that might be a great buying opportunity, but you have to be thinking long term. Um, I would actually be waiting similar for something on NEO for a nice pullback in NEO. But yes, um, I, I agree. If you're looking at price long term and you're going off pure technicals and fundamentals, shouldn't matter. You are correct. Um, Mike says, are there enough rare earth minerals for electric vehicles? I have no idea. I have no idea if if there are. Um, yeah, big gap. I haven't ridden the i8, but just the i3 really, really impressed me. So yeah, I, I agree with you, GD. I mean, if you're looking at making just a trade, right? And when I when we say trade, we're talking rather short term, right? Maybe a couple days, a couple weeks. Um, the analysis I was doing at the beginning of this whole thing was saying, let's look at this as a sector. And, and the big boom. And it's not the big boom that like just happened, right? This isn't saying, hey, this is just all of a sudden happened today. This has been going on, it's been getting bigger and bigger. And I think this boom will continue. 
I think you're gonna see this boom in that space continue for a long time until we start to see major competition and a major, um, I guess, consolidation in the industry. Certainly, I think BMW, Toyota, Honda are going to really have a say in this and really kind of say, I will, here's what, what we are going to do. BMW is already doing it with some of their vehicles, the i-series, the 3s and the 8s, which I think are pretty cool. Um, you also have Ford, which I was kind of surprised to see Ford making big investments in an EV company such as Rivian uh, and Amazon. I thought that was kind of interesting. Bezos is no stupid guy, so I'm, I'm pretty sure he's got his fingerprints all over that one. Um, they're public or they're private traded right now. That's Rivian, and I'm not sure if they will go public. We'll see if it happens at some point. I'll keep my eye on that one. Okay. Um, you know what? I don't know about that, Mike. Uh, the charging companies, per se, that area I don't have any real under, knowledge of. I know that there's different types. You know, you have the hydrogen one. You've got Tesla's one. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a knowledge in that space. But that will also be the big challenge, you know, for this industry to get to the point where it's going to be massive. For example, the the, the Nikola. Let's say they build, uh, you know, 18 wheelers that are electric. Well, I mean, their focus right now better be looking at every major interstate and putting up charging like supercharging stations at all the truck stops because you need to have those things turn around refueled quickly recharge quickly um, whereas for someone like uh, Tesla it's a little bit easier you can have a home charging station I know at my office there's also a charging station there so we built one in because there are a lot of people with Tesla's at the office but there you go. All right, let me go to some more list of questions. This was from Steve. He says, I bought nickel at 75 and it keeps falling. What would you do? I'm not even going to look at the chart. Get out. <laughs> Dump it. Move on. You should have watched the show. We talked about this thing way overpriced. Maybe for 20 years down the road, 75 is great, but it was way overpriced off of hype. What do you do? Well, you bring up that chart, and just like we just did a second ago, you say, what do I want? Where's a buy point that I'd be happy buying? If you bought it at 75, Steve, and I'll, I'll do a, I'll put a line on here on 75 for Nikola. Um, 75 on there. Oh, nice. You you bought like right as it broke up. Maybe you bought it right as it broke out above this high from the 16th of June, huh? Um, thinking it might get that next leg up. Well, if you did that, you should have. There should certainly have been a stop loss in here somewhere. I mean, the last couple of days have been just brutal for, for nickel, and I don't think it's going to get much worse. Um, and here, you want to know who's holding the bag on this one? Look at the chart, guys. Nickel has fallen from $75 down to $48 in, let's say, two weeks. Oh, let's go check what Robin Hood has done, shall we? Ha, ha, ha. Rob the, rob the rich and give to the poor, right? All right, so let's go into, um, where is it? Nicola, there it is. Okay, we'll bring up Nicola's chart here. And you guys can see this green line represents all of the Nicola customers, the number of accounts that it's been in. Um, and the red line or magenta line here represents the price. And you can see right where I have my cursor is when it was at 75 bucks. Steve, are you a Robin Hood trader? Just curious. Send that one in. Um, you notice that the number of accounts has actually been going up as this Nicola price has been falling. So there are a lot of holders at Robin Hood right now that are getting taken in the shorts because they bought that hype, that big spike to the upside. So rather interesting there on what's going on with uh, with Nikola. I, for one, would not be happy with that stock. I would sell it, and I'd be happy to buy back at a lower price. If you could sell some puts, maybe you can do it that way. But, you know, these are this stuff is juggling chainsaws right now, and that's a dangerous endeavor. Every now and again, you're going to get caught in that type of transaction and trading the most volatile stock of the day, and this is arguably one of the more volatile securities right now. So I would... Uh, I'd be careful with that. I would probably close out my trade, lick my wounds, and move on to the next one. Okay, uh, what else you guys got for me? I bought Tesla at 734. Where do you get out? Oh, God, Robert, that is such a hard question. I mean, you're in a, in a cash cow right now. You know, I mean, it's hard to say to dump Tesla because it just keeps on going. Look, the, the one thing you're worried about with... Um, with Tesla is that it could have a Musk moment, if you will. And what I mean by Musk moment is where Musk does something and you just scratch your head and go, well, why the hell would you say that? Like when he said his share prices are overvalued and you get all of a sudden a 30, 40% drop overnight. For Robert, he's up 50% on this bad boy, almost 50%. What you could do is just do an arbitrary stop. We talked about this with a couple of our guests over the past couple weeks, which is take your stop loss and just move it up above the, the, or sorry, just, just below the low of the day. So for example, we look at this chart of Tesla right now, and the low of the day, I'll make sure it's in snap mode so we can all see it. Low of the day on Tesla for today was 1266. 
So maybe you tell yourself, hey, if this thing gets down to 1265, I'm just gonna dump it. Could it go up to 4,000? Could it go up to 10,000? Could it go up to 100,000? Yeah, it could. But you've got a gift horse in the mouth. What I hate to see is all of a sudden it just comes ripping back down as we have seen. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll bring up a chart here again so you guys can see some of the aggressive down moves. I mean, you saw it back in February where this thing fell from 947 all the way down to 350. And of course, that was COVID. Um, you also have this two day window of time where it fell from 870 all the way down to, it was a $200 drop in two days. You know, these types of moves are not foreign to Tesla and you know, you wanna make sure that you don't give it all back. So I would certainly be putting in uh, stop loss, moving it up, that way you, you're almost guaranteed. I can't say you're guaranteed to take a profit because what happens if tomorrow morning Tesla opens up at you know 300? Well, you're underwater. So uh, unfortunately, I want to lock in profit but not get whipsawed out, yeah. Well, I mean, at this point, Robert, I'm pretty sure you're happy with your gains, right? I mean, if you if you bought it at 700 and you ended up making, uh, you know, let's say, uh, you got it at 1200, you made 500 dollars on that. That's a great investment, and you know, you probably bought it at 700 back in May or April. That's a, that, that's that's a pretty great rate of return. So I'd be very happy with that. The thing we have to do for for all of us right now, stop is around 1100. I I personally would move mine up to 1200. Just I, Lock in the next time. I mean, look look at the chart. We've got a 1266 is that current line. Look at the low from where it gapped up. You know, 1185. Maybe maybe that's where I move my stop to and say, hey, if it gets 1185, I'm just dumping it before it you know closes that second gap. Um, I'm a little more cheap, so I would be moving my stop below 1266 just because I don't want to risk it filling that gap. And you know, the the tricky part here is, or not tricky, just that the challenge that you're going to have is the guilt after because no matter what price you sell out at it might drift down for the next period of you know months or maybe a year or so who knows but then all of a sudden you're gonna look back someday and tesla will be at three thousand you go god i had that thing long at 700 son of i why did i sell you know that's where you have to take that long-term perspective i for one think it would be better to sell with a stop loss if it comes back down to another zone i'll buy back in long and just keep playing that so i don't have to ride it out in one trade to get to the end goal, but I'm taking a lot of chunks along the way and hopefully at the end goal having a much higher rate of return. That's just the way that I would look at it. So it's a decision you gotta make for yourself, but that's how I would be trailing it. I'd be moving that stop loss up. Uh, at this rate, rate now that's gone parabolic, I would be doing it under the lows of the previous day. Okay, um, oh God, Joseph, Tesla's been the CNBC buzzword for a while now. I mean, I mean, if you're not talking Tesla, you're not getting views. You know, it's like it's like the media and sensationalism. You got to have your top five stories have to be something about murder, death, and killing, uh, and then you know, let's have to throw a, a BLI, BLM story in there, and and you're fine for a news program. With financial programs, you have to be talking about Tesla. You have to. Um, even Apple's kind of like not even the talk du jour anymore. It's Amazon, it's Tesla, and even Facebook. Um, I hate to throw Twitter in there, but Twitter seems to be. Uh, fighting its way back into the news with regularity, but Amazon and Tesla are the way to go. Uh, let's look at the chart here. There was a comment on Amazon. Yeah, Amazon as well. Look at this four day run for Amazon. It's pretty phenomenal. It's right now at 3,057, which is why we saw these markets rip like they did today, which I think maybe it just might be an opportunity for me to get to the market update and talk about our top, not, not top seven markets, but at least the top six markets. Nice nice segue there, thanks for uh, thanks for that transition help. All right, I messed my charts up, so I'm gonna real clean this one up here real quick just so I can uh, show you this. We'll run through the top seven here because it was an interesting day with regards to gains. Bitcoin led the way, yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm gonna start things off with crude oil, and don't worry, we'll do this and then I'll get some, um, um, list of questions. Fink Fink says, could you buy puts Certainly you could buy puts. You know, Tesla's puts are gonna be inflated right now, right? They're, they're gonna be inflated because it's just gone parabolic. A lot of people are going to be looking for protection, but um, <coughs> you uh, certainly could be buying puts out there. All right, Mike says, sounds like a real opportunity for remove and replace batteries to get truckers going in minutes and not hours. That, you know, that's a very interesting one. There's newer technology. So there was a company out there, I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was Candy Tech, um, symbol is KNDI, that that's what their specialty was, was hot swapping batteries. I believe it was Candy, and I'm not 100% sure now, but in doing research for this, there are companies that are specializing in hot swapping batteries. But now the technology's gotten so good that that technology is kind of already starting to fade away. 
Um, for big truckers, yeah, it seems to me like that would be uh, the way to go, right? You pull into the truck stop, some guy rolls up and he's got a little flatbed cart and you swap, you take your batteries out one side, put them in the other side and just keep on rolling so you don't even have to stop. Oh, but let's face it, truckers like to stop, come on. So yeah, hot swapping batteries is definitely one of the ones that's a, a technology out there in the space. All right, uh, back to our market update. Crude oil, it is still stuck to that line, but notice, man, I'm telling you, that I, I, I want to do a show just on chart patterns, but I just don't have the time to build out all the slides and graphics that I need. Look at that chart, though. It's beautiful. This is an ascending triangle in one of its best forms. So let me go to um, drawing tools, and I will show you why this is so great. I mean, you're looking at it right now, just tiptoeing through these lows. Don't worry about the, the gains. That's this percentage mark has nothing to do with it. It's just, uh, there you go. Um, if you look at this pattern, this is an ascending triangle and it just keeps smacking its head on $40 and 69 cents. I mean, right now it's at 40.59. This is pressure every single day, pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing up to the upside. At some point, this is going to break. I've been saying this for weeks now. This is no uh, fresh story here, right? You guys have heard me say this over and over again on that chart. If this thing keeps on pushing and pushing and smacking its head, it's going to break above that line right there at $40.59. It's, it's gonna happen. So um, hopefully it happens sooner rather than later. It's just been building here, and I think on the next drift down to this upward trend line, you might wanna be looking at maybe buying some calls on this thing or buying into it. It looks like it's gonna uh, pop to the upside. So crude oil was down 0.15% today, so not too big of a deal. You had gold was up 0.22%, still just below that 1800 mark, but boy, it's been a great rally. That yellow box I had up there for the past couple of weeks, I've taken it off, but we are now in the upper side of it. We might see a close above 1800 and after that, you got to take a step back to like a monthly chart to find your levels here. And of course, that means gold might have a smooth run up to 1900 here. Woo! That would be great for you long, you gold bugs. We'll get John O'Donnell back on the show. All right, equity markets took the show today, or led the show today. Russell 2000 was your weakest of the three indexes that I like to look at. It was up 0.6% to 1,441. Technically, no big deal. You guys can see there's really nothing here that's noteworthy on the daily. S&P 500, it was noteworthy because we closed above these highs. This is obviously uh, that my put position will probably, exp well, not expire, worthless, uh, but I'll probably lose most of my investment on those 460 puts, unfortunately, until something, unless something drastic happens in the next two weeks, that'll be a bad loser for me, but oh well. 1.26% gain to 3,168 for the ES. Right now, it looks like smooth sailing to 3,200. I don't see much stopping it here. NASDAQ 100 was the best. Thank you, Amazon, for that big surge. Giant green candle here, all-time highs, just continuing to rip up 2.34%, 10,000. 597 and the best performer bitcoin now of course it has uh, been tanking or just drifting i should say over the past two months a nice little green candle out there today but all in all it doesn't mean much it's been looking rather weak it's still holding that nine thousand dollar level all right whoo it got really hot in my office i gotta get that ac bill i'm like sweating on the show today guys i'm getting hot in here uh what else do we have can you buy some puts long haul trucks will be self-driving um, I hope so, Big Ed. Wouldn't it be great if we had just self-driving trucks? Uh, that's a dangerous thing, but I mean, you don't have to worry about sleeping at the wheel. I mean, the cars are pretty much self-driving anyway. Um, yeah, Alpha. I don't, is he still alive? Is Thomas Bukowski still alive? I'll tell you what. I would get Thomas Bukowski on the program, but here's what I'm worried about. I don't want to have somebody like Thomas Bukowski on the program to talk about chart patterns because those guys geek out. They're so far on the other end of the spectrum of geeky and technology and behind the numbers that unless you're a quant or someone writing algorithms, who cares? Let's go just to the, look at the chart and say, what does this mean to me as a trader, as a simpleton, as somebody who doesn't want to be overwhelmed by all the BS and 500 plus pages of your book? Let me just say, here's an ascending triangle. This is why it's significant. Here's what to look for. Here's how you trade it. It's like we should do that with every chart pattern, right? Here's what it is, here's how you identify it, here's how uh, what it means and why it's important, and here's how you trade it. Done, those five things. And I need, it could be a one page document for every pattern out there. I could probably build that, that'd be my book. There you go. <laughs> uh, what do you think about Twitter? Well, I'm not a fan of Twitter. I don't like Twitter at all. Well, unfortunately, I have to use it. TWTR, I've, I've been on the, the negative side of Twitter for a while. I'm, I'm just, I just kind of felt like it was fading away and, and maybe it's President Trump has helped in its uh, vitality and keeping this one alive because it's, well, it's Twitter. Um, technically, 
I don't really see too much that I like. I actually do look at this a uh, little bit of a supply zone here, right around 33.75. I like that as a potential shorting opportunity. Um, you notice that you just got a massive wave of chop back and forth and back and forth. So my bias would probably be to the south side here on Twitter, but I don't like anything in its, on its daily chart right now. It doesn't really have anything that um, you know, screams out at me. Doesn't uh, TradeStation have a tool that automatically tells you the pattern on the chart? Nah, I don't think TradeStation does. There are some other resources and and maybe if I have some time alone this week I will um, I'll show you some of those there is a, a site that I like to use that actually will call out you know ascending triangles descending triangles double tops double bottoms head and shoulders patterns and most of the time and they're using an algorithm right to find it most of the time when I look at their descending triangle I just squint at it and go are you kidding me that's not a descending triangle so you have to take it with uh, a grain of salt, but there are some uh, free sites out there which I'll show you where you can filter through some of those and find maybe ideas, trading ideas. I just put them on your watch list and alerts. Uh, Vente, we, I don't do penny stocks in the show. For me, penny stocks are straight gambling, and uh, you know, as a trader, someone's been doing this for 20 plus years. I'm, I'm a speculator at heart, but I'm not doing penny stock gambling. That stuff is, you're basically trying to hit a grand slam and you hope you get lucky. That's not what, what this show is about or what we do on the program. So I'm sorry, no penny stock recommendations. Uh, not, not doing anything like that on this program. Um, if the president goes to parlor, the Twitter is dead. We shall see. Who knows what that president will do. He always keeps us on our toes, doesn't he? All right, what time do I got? Oh, 45. Crikey. Uh, I'm going to real quickly mention this one. This is for a viewer out at Thomas. He says, I'm a computer novice and have struggled with my several platforms. In January, I decided to commit my activities to Click. Of course, Click is Online Trading Academy's proprietary platform uh, with a TW account supplying charts. I suspected to be able to live trade very soon. Using Sim, I have a fairly good handle on Click, but my virus, lawsuit, civil unrest have been obviously delaying progress. I don't really want to abandon Click and try to start over uh, with learning another platform, but most of the traders I follow no longer display Click. Uh, am I wasting my time? The answer is no, you're not wasting your time. The only reason I think that there might be people like myself who aren't using Click for everything is because right now it doesn't have all the asset classes. I know that they've been working feverishly to plug in different asset classes and get live execution going on it. It's a monumental task. Uh, it's a great platform, has a lot of great functionality, especially if you're an Online Trading Academy graduate because it takes exactly what you learn in the classroom and that those calculations are built directly in. Things like Trade Builder, it's all built in. Step one, step two, step three, step four, that's all built into the platform. So I think that's a great um, um, way to learn the markets and, and be better with your platform. All platforms are pretty much the same. So if you go to Click and TradingView and TradeStation and Ameritrade, they're gonna have the same basic functionality. So I would say stick with Click. If you're comfortable with it, just stick with it. Keep working with it. Um, hopefully the executions will be opened up soon. If not, you can always switch to a different platform, but it'll have the same basic look and feel. Just make sure you're comfortable with it before you start trading live out there. But uh, they're almost all the same basic functionality. And I'm uh, sorry, DJ or GD, I, I didn't even answer your question. Uh, he asked if I would, what about 1860? on Twitter. Uh, so let me put it, 1860, Ooh, let's go, that's a long way away. Uh, let's go here and on in snap mode. 1860, I don't know if we'll see that price. On Twitter, TWTR, okay. Uh, let me go back to the monthly then because that's where we're gonna have to go out to get to that bad boy. Um, look, if it got down to, first off, it would have to get down there for me to even think about it. Right now you're at 32, so you're talking, you know, what a 40% decline in price before you become interested in the security. To me, you're wasting a lot of time by waiting for it to fall all the way down there. Could you set an alert and, say, and have it alert you? I, I would set my alert for $19 and say, alert me when Twitter hits $19 and never have to look at the stock. You know, that's, that's kind of what I would do. Um, I would not focus on that 1860 and say, I want to make a trade there. I'll wait and say if it gets there. Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels hoping it gets to 1860. Um, other than that, let's see. Uh, this is the monthly time frame. I don't know if it'll give me, let's see, that is back into July of 2017. So let me go back to a daily and see if I can get that kind of data. I have to uh, change a symbol here so I can get back to more time frame. We'll go six years. And that was July. All right, so line should still be on my chart. I'll scroll over here. I'm just curious what kind of zone that might lead up to. So it's, it's gonna take me a second to scroll all the way back there, guys. This is what, 2019? Whew, way back. Mm -mm -mm. All right, so as I continue to go on here, I am now at 2016. And there's the line right there. All right. 
So I'm looking at that line. I'm not a huge fan of it, to be honest. Why? For example, look what happens when it left that area. Why is that significant to us? It's it's really not. You know, you could say that that's going to be a retest point at some point in time, sure. Um, but you, I don't know why you picked 1860. Is it because of this high right here? You know, I'd be more inclined to think something along the lines of these lows right in here, like 19 and a quarter, or I'd be more inclined to think at the origin of this gap, which would be 17, and we'll call it 17 dollars. Um, but if you scroll through here, there are some other areas that have very appealing stop potential, like 22. I'll call it 22.50. Right, that one looks good to me as a potentials for this bad boy. Oh, there's another good one, um, but it's not fresh. And I'm just kind of looking at all the different levels here. And other than that, I don't see too much that really has me excited on on Twitter. You know, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the to the, let's say a weekly here, just so you can see the levels that we're put in. And those are lines that I have drawn in the charts for my for my setup. So 19 and a quarter would be one that I like more so than that initial number you had put in there. There you go. 22.36. Yeah. Yep. I would. I'd like that one as well. Certainly. Only problem is that 2236 I don't think was fresh. All right, so. All right, what else do I got? I got a, we're pretty good. All right, so let me um, let me bring up your markets for tomorrow. I want to real quickly show you what happened today. Now, for those who are trading Aussie dollar, you do have a big day in front of you still. Um, I think it's nine o'clock tonight, so you're looking what another six seven hours from now. You will have an economic announcement for Australia, which is a rate statement. Right now, expectations are they're gonna stay right where they're at at 25 basis points, but as soon as the RBA makes their statement, it could go haywire. So be careful with that one, it happens this evening. Um, other than that, the main reason we saw this nice bump today was we had good numbers out of the financial services and uh, PMI numbers for the US, as well as non-manufacturing. We actually went positive, which shows economic expansion, which is a very positive sign. Uh, and also that was coming on the heels of Europe with a very nice retail sales number beating the expectations. Uh, they had 15% and they came out at 17.8% increase. So that was obviously a nice day for the European Union. And there you can see the main drivers for today's market. Now tomorrow, there's nothing on the, econo or the earnings front there is economic announcements for this is it says the seventh here. You're looking at uh, IBD tip economic optimism numbers for the U.S. as well as Jolt's job openings. I'll say that one three times fast. Uh, other than that, not a lot here that's noteworthy or really important for tomorrow's session with regards to the economic announcement. So that will do it for today. Uh, let me see tomorrow. Actually, I've got a, a, an interesting week here. Let me real quickly. I think I may have updated this. I'm not sure. I tried to update the website and I think I may have forgot. Um, I told you guys I put the list of the upcoming guests on the show on the website so you can see the guest schedule at the very top. Um, dude, yeah, I didn't update it. Dab nab it. All right, well, I'll have to change that one. Uh, we're going to have Ryan Watkins on the program tomorrow talking about price action. Wednesday, we'll have, uh, da, 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 I think we're going to have Tilly Allison on the program. Thursday, Finally get the guy on the show. I've been trying to get Dr. Woody Johnson on the program to talk trading psychology. You guys might know Dr. Woody Johnson from his books and his uh, series he did for Only Trading Academy. The guy's fantastic. Uh, we'll talk about market psychology on Thursday. So we've got a pretty full week out there with regards to guests, which makes it easier for me. And hopefully you guys enjoy the diversity of guests we bring on. If you have any questions, want me to go deeper into anything we talked about on today's show, do me a favor. First off, click the like button. If you are new, I know we've got some new people. Click the subscribe button. Click the little bell there so you can be updated when I do make updates to um, different shows or release certain shows. You can also go to TraderMerlin.com, send in your comments and questions there. We're always happy to answer those as they come through. So please feel free to send us any questions at TraderMerlin.com or post them down below the video, down below the YouTube uh, video, and I'll get to all those on tomorrow's show. Until then, happy trading, everybody. I will see you tomorrow.